All right, well, good morning, church. Man, it is good to see you guys. Happy New Year. Man, my name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ben Davis Christian Church. And if you're new around here, I want to say that we love you already. Uh, God has a plan for your life, and we are excited uh, to discover that alongside you here at our church. Well, there is a saying that's come to prominence in the past couple of years, and that is the struggle is real. It's sometimes used as an alternative to first world problems. So you might have seen a few memes like this one floating around on the internet. You know, the, the struggle is real. This one takes me back to college a little bit. Uh, but seriously, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. Every day, we struggle with invisible forces in the heavenly realms. That's what Paul says on this particular subject. Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He goes on. He says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle. This is our key verse for the series. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. So Paul says that everyone has a struggle of sorts, but there's more here than meets the eye. Your struggle isn't the person who's irritating you. Uh, your struggle isn't the person who's talking or going around behind your back. Your struggle is not your boss, and your struggle is definitely not your spouse. It's instead what Paul calls the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So the bad news, church, is that you have an enemy and he's invisible. You see, when you became a Christian, you were thrust into the heart of a spiritual battle. By swearing your unswerving allegiance to King Jesus, you made yourself the sworn enemy of Satan. And that might sound a bit dramatic, but it's no less true. He and his minions began to attack you mercilessly on every side, doing everything in their power to do three things. To first, tempt you. To second, discourage you. And to third, distract you. This is what the enemy does. Everything in his power to tempt, to distract, and to discourage us. This is the scheme of Satan. And Christians call these relentless attacks spiritual warfare. That's what we call this. We call it spiritual warfare. And we read all about this here in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, Ephesians is a prison letter. It's written by Paul. I mean, who else? Paul did write two-thirds of the New Testament. He wrote most of his letters over a 15-year period. But four of his letters came during a two-year prison sentence that he spent in Rome. Now, it's during this time that Paul's allowed to live at home, but there's one caveat. While he's under prison arrest, he is chained to a guard 24-7, uh, uh, you know, 24-7, just constantly. Now, I got to think, though, like, while well, we think, okay, Paul's chained, well, maybe it's actually the guard who's chained, because after all, you're talking about being chained to the world's foremost evangelist, you know, the person who spread the gospel worldwide. You've got to think, in a very literal sense, that guard is a constant captive audience. But check out what Paul says as he goes on in verse 18. He says, and I pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. And then Paul goes on and he says, Pray also for me <clears throat> that whenever I speak, words may be given to me, so uh, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So the Apostle Paul. He, he asks the Ephesians to pray. He asks them to pray for all people, and he asks for a very specific prayer. He says, hey, pray for me. Don't forget about me. Paul says, pray that I can speak boldly. Now, did you catch that? Did you catch that? 
No, Paul doesn't ask to be free from his chains, but free from the fear that constrains Christians from sharing the gospel with their neighbors. And I think there's a lesson here for us in this. Some pray for a lighter load to haul. Some pray for the strength to carry it. The Apostle Paul, he's the kind of person who prays for the strength to carry it. Specifically, Paul asks that he won't be distracted by the enemy's attack. He prays that he can stay laser-focused on the mission, the purpose that God has given for his life, spreading the gospel to the very ends of the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I think Paul is struggling a little bit. After all, there's a reason they call it hard time. I mean, yes, it's, it's a prison sentence at home, but he's chained. He can't go and do what he wants to do. I mean, I've got to think the guy wants to be free. I've got to think that Paul wants to be out of these chains. He wants to be on the other side of, you know, his prison cell. He wants to be out on the mission field. He wants to be planting churches, growing churches worldwide, but he can't. He's all chained up. And he's weighed down by discouragement. At least that's how I read it. I read Paul as struggling with some distractions. The distractions, the hardships, the reality of his change, uh, the, the discouragement that he's experiencing in his life. See, I read it as the enemy tempts, the enemy distracts, the enemy discourages. And that's evident in my life. That's what I experience constantly in my life. I, I think about these three things. I, I, I frame them in this message, and I think, man, how much, you know, do I struggle with temptation, with distraction, with discouragement? Like, as a pastor, I, I struggle with these things. As, as a dad, I struggle with these things. As a husband, just as a man, you know, I struggle with these things. And there's on some, some level some encouragement here that Paul is saying, yeah, me too. Yeah, if, if you've ever struggled with temptation, with discouragement, with distraction, then you're in really good company because you're in the company of the Apostle Paul and every Christian who's ever lived and breathed. And so as the Apostle Paul puts the finishing touches then— here on the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, this last chapter, he signs off with this conversation about spiritual warfare. And I can't help but wonder, is the Apostle Paul preaching to the Ephesians, or is he preaching to himself? You see, church, at times, every now and then, we need to preach to ourselves. We need to preach that God is endlessly good, no matter what's happening in our life. God is good, amen? God is good, always good. We need to preach that there's more than meets the eye. There's more than this natural world that surrounds us. There are supernatural forces, angels and demons battling for human souls and an enemy doing everything he can to tempt, to distract, and to discourage you. That is the reality that we encounter this morning. So this month, throughout the month of January, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. Our key verse is going to be Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Today, I'm going to introduce this idea of spiritual warfare and the struggle. And this series is going to get fleshed out really good. Next week, I'm going to come back. I'm going to talk about the full armor of God. And then the week after that, January 16th, my very good friend, someone I look up to a lot, Dr. Gary Johnson. Everybody loves Gary, right? You guys love Gary. Gary's going to come, and he is going to give us a master class on spiritual warfare. I'm going to come back. I'm going to talk about breaking spiritual strongholds on the 23rd. And then on the 30th, Dr. David Roadcup who's written a lot on the subject of prayer and fasting, is going to come, and he's going to talk to us about prayer and fasting. as kind of the capstone for this series. So this is going to be a really good series, all right? So who's ready to be battle ready? You guys ready to be? Say, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, if you're ready, then we're just going to dive into this series. Let's start by talking about the struggle. Let's talk about the struggle. First and foremost, the struggle is real world. We're talking about a real-world struggle here. We're talking about a struggle that is not made up. It's not simply all in your head. It's not something that Christians conjured up to scare people into faith. We're talking about a real-world struggle. Spiritual warfare is a reality and it is a serious part of the Christian life. Whether you want to admit that or not, whether you want to acknowledge that or not, whether you were ignorant of that when you walked in these doors, this is real and it's happening and the major thrust of spiritual warfare is more than 
the sensational types of demonic manifestations. For example, when we talk about the more sensational types of demonic manifestations, we talk first and foremost about obsession. You know, people who get obsessed with uh, demons, uh, whether that's just, you know, they're telling the stories, they're reading the books, whatever it is, or, or even they're just playing the games. And, and people ask me as a pastor, like, you know, should Christians do, you know, Ouija boards, tarot cards, and fortune tellers? And, and I know there are a lot of people out there who are just like, oh, man, here we go. This is going to make it. But listen, I, I kind of say you should treat those things like a gun you find. Right? Like, when I was a little kid, I remember walking down the road one time, and in the ditch, there was a gun. And one of my buddies, he picked that up, and he took it home. I knew better than that. You know, because I was taught as a kid, when you find a gun, you go, you tell an adult about it, because you don't know if that gun is loaded. And so when it comes to these kinds of things, when it comes to, you know, entertaining these ideas, inviting demons, spirits into our lives, I just say, man, just treat it like a gun. You don't know if it's loaded. You don't know if there's power in that or not. So there's this level of, uh, of obsession that sometimes can lead some people to oppression. And then the last level is possession. And people ask me, like, Ryan, does that stuff really happen? Is, is that stuff really for real? Well, yeah, it is. It is. And, and I can tell you, I've seen all three levels of this, both here in the United States and in the mission field. I've experienced, I've seen these things. It's real. Here's the problem. Church, if, if we don't see Satan as an actual part of this day-in-and-out struggle, we'll wrestle with the flesh and blood realities and forget that there are also spiritual beings that we're struggling with, that we're struggling with principalities and powers. So in spiritual battle, I'm going to talk about our adversaries. I'm going to talk about the struggles, the spiritual things that are putting all kinds of pressure on our life. And it all begins right here. First and foremost is the world. The very first of our adversaries, the very first of our spiritual struggles is the world. This is what the book of 1 John says. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father. They are from this world. And then he caps it off by saying this. And this world is fading away. So if you think that you, you, you can just put your hope, your, your faith in this world, it's, it's fading away. It's soon to be lost along with everything people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. And what pleases God, the book of Hebrews says, without faith. It's impossible to please God. So here's what we've got, right? The, uh, what we read right off the bat in Scripture is that our very first adversary in the spiritual struggle is the world. Now, I want to kind of quantify this for just a second, because there might be someone out there who's saying, wait, 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 wait. I, I thought, you know, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, but as a Christian, what John is saying is that if I love the world, then that means I become the enemy of God. So explain that tension for me. Well, the Greek word for world is cosmos, and it's used a lot of different ways throughout the Bible. Mostly, it can fit into one of three broad categories. First, it can describe the people of the world, as in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So cosmos is used in that manner, used to describe the people of the world who God loved so much that he would sacrifice his one and only son for. The second way that world can be understood is in terms of the planet. You know, cosmos can describe the planet, the earth, as in everything that God created. Other times, uh, this word cosmos is shorthand for worldliness, right? The world as in worldliness described here in 1 John as lust, envy, and pride. Now listen, church, context is absolutely everything. And so the world that John is talking about is different than uh, the people or the planet itself. Christians are called to make this critical distinction. As a Christian, we have commands from Jesus, the great commandment, which is to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself, right? 
This is the first and the second commandment. These are the greatest commandments. And then there is the great commission, which is that we go out into the world and we make disciples of all nations. You go way back into Genesis and you get the cultural mandate, sometimes called the creation mandate. I know that kind of sounds more like a UN resolution than a biblical ideal. But it's, it's this command of God in which he tells humans, like, hey, I want you to fill the world and subdue the world. So I want you to create and I want you to care for the earth. So, we're, you know, what we've got is commandments, commissions, mandates. John is clearly not talking about these things. He's talking about worldliness. He's talking about the world or the external pressure to sin. The external pressure to sin. And oftentimes, when we experience this pressure to sin, what we would call this from a biblical ideal is conformity. This pressure to conform to the patterns of the world, man, and the world gives us so many options to conform through advertising, TV shows, movies. We're told that if we wear the right clothes, say the right things, act the right way, then we'll be loved and accepted by everyone. And because of our cancel culture, man, we, we feel that pressure more now than ever before. The biblical tension, however, is can we squeeze into the world's molds and still follow Jesus? Jesus had this to say to his friends in John chapter 15, verse 19. Jesus said, the world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. Like if you would just conform to the world's patterns, if you would just give in to the world's ideas, if you'll just say, yeah, you know, I'll trade out this biblical fundamental for what the world deems as acceptable so that I can be accepted into the culture, into my friends. And man, the world would love you, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world. So it what? So it, it what, church? It hates you. The world has actually aligned itself against you. You stand on biblical truth. You go the way of Jesus. It's not like all the time Mr. Rogers' neighborhood here. The world will find its conflict with you and biblical ideals every single time. Jesus says, because the world first hated me, it's going to dump on you. Church, following Jesus isn't always going to be acceptable, and more likely, it's not always going to be popular. If it is, you're probably doing it wrong. If it is, you're probably doing it wrong. Jesus goes as far to say that in some circles you'll be hated. No wonder the external pressure to conform can be so powerful, so such a lure to us. And so it's true. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's also true that if we love the world, we can't also love the Lord our God with all our hearts. I think Jesus said it best. He said, no one can serve. How many masters? Two masters. You can't do that. It doesn't work out. You, you can't have two bosses, all right? You, you can't have two masters. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate the one and love the other. You'll be devoted to the one, and you will despise the other. It just doesn't work, so we have to make our choice. Do we want to be accepted by this world, or do we want to be acceptable to God by faith in Christ, and through that become increasingly more and more like Jesus? Here is the second pressure, the second adversary that we face. If you're taking notes, write this one down. It is the flesh. The flesh. Although the external pressure of the world is very real, you also need to know that the struggle to turn away from God in your own way comes deep from within. Over 90 times, Paul speaks of the flesh. He talks about the flesh over and over again. In a nutshell, the flesh is the internal pressure to sin. So you have this external pressure. Hey, you want to be accepted, don't you? You don't want to be canceled, do you? You, you want to go and, and belong to this place, have a sense that you belong, that you fit in, right? That's the external pressure. But then there's the internal pressure. Do what you want to do, man. Don't you want that? Don't you crave that? Won't that satisfy you? Even if it's just for a moment, it's, it's worth it, isn't it? I mean, this is a really simple and straightforward concept. It's one that we experience so uh, commonly. I don't think it needs a whole lot of explanation. For that reason, in the book of Galatians, Paul assumes that we already know what the flesh is. So instead, he spends the majority of his time talking about what the flesh does. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, he says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. 
For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now that last line can be a little bit tricky, so let me explain what that means. If you have ever wanted to serve God, if you have ever wanted to do the right thing, like a lot of people, that like gets New Year's resolution time, baby, you know, and we're like, yeah, I'm going to get this year right. And I don't mean to be a downer, but the reality is, is most of us are going to blow our resolutions by Wednesday, all right? That, that's the statistic, okay? That's just the reality of it. Why is that? Why is it that, you know, I catch myself wanting to do these good things for my life, but I can't do it? Friend, that's the battle between flesh and spirit. And it's kind of like oil and water. Think about it like oil and water. You know, no doubt when you were a kid and you were in some kind of physical science class as a kid, you know, really simple experiment. But, but your, your teacher brought out that cup and, and they put oil and they put water in it. And, and the water and the oil would never mix. Like you could stir it, you could shake it, no matter how hard you tried. You might get a couple of bubbles for just a moment, but eventually that's going to separate. It's just not going to mix. So picture your body for a moment kind of like a container. And in you is not oil and water. Instead, it's flesh and spirit. And what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians is that these things not only mix, don't mix, they're actually opposed to one another. So you have this battle happening inside you all the time. At, at times, we might describe this kind of like a spiritual tug of war, Right? Like the spirit is jerking us toward holiness, but then the flesh is constantly jerking us back toward our own fleshy desires. And so for some of us, it can feel like this tireless, relentless battle. We find ourselves struggling between the good we want to do, but can't, and the bad we don't want to do, but constantly find ourselves intertwined and in, like flying off the handle. You know, raiding the refrigerator late at night, emptying the whole bottle in one sitting, or flirting with that person in the office, and it happens. And you think, man, when, when do I stop this? Like, when do I finally get over this? Like, when am I finally going to win? Will I ever listen? Every Christian, no matter how far they are in their faith journey, will experience the struggle between flesh and spirit. I struggle, so did Paul. And that's why he sets the record straight in Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, Paul says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. And then he goes on, and he says, and I know nothing good lives in me. That is my own sinful nature, my flesh. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. He says, can anybody relate to this? He says, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And so the Apostle Paul, he can relate to us. He's saying, man, I get that. Like, there's this tension between flesh and spirit, this constant tug of war, and it's a typical Christian testimony. So if, if you can relate to this, if you're saying, man, that sounds like me, that sounds like my battle with my, you know, cupboards at home, that, that sounds like my battle with my screen time, my battle with pornography, my, my battle with my anger, my, my battle with gossip, my, my battle with spending, like if, if you can relate to this church, again, you're in good company because the Apostle Paul says, man, welcome to spiritual warfare. See, this is the tension that the down-and-out, drowsy disciples experienced when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they kept falling asleep. Remember what Jesus said? He said, the Spirit is willing, Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. He said, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. The flesh is weak. Fortunately, as you become more and more like Jesus— you will also begin to live more in the spirit and less in the flesh. That's the idea anyway, but no one's perfect. No one bats a thousand. There will be days you just flat out strike out. There will be days you find yourself on the winning side. There will also be days you find yourself being drug into the mud. All right, here's the third adversary. The third adversary I want to introduce you today is, in fact, the devil. The devil is the supernatural pressure to sin. The devil, the supernatural pressure to sin. It's been said that one of Satan's most effective schemes is to make people believe that he doesn't exist. 
Okay, and you know, oftentimes we see this because we're children of the Enlightenment here in the United States, and so we, in our minds, you know, we've evolved past having to explain things through angels and demons. And I think knowing this, Satan's best weapon for you and I is to kind of remain anonymous here in the United States, kind of play. In the back scene if you would Because if you believe there's a devil Then you're naturally going to believe There's also what? A God And what I've seen on the mission field Is actually that people in developing nations Tend to worship what they fear So whereas we have this prevalent atheism We want to explain things away to reason We want to live in this natural world And nowhere else We're children of the enlightenment People in the developing world You know they tend to worship what they fear so, for example, in Haiti, um, several years ago, when we built a school on top of Tibucan, uh, when, when we got that ground, I remember going uh, to, to Tibucan, uh, to that lot that we had, and there were all of these clay vessels just all around the property. And what was in those clay vessels were poison. Voodoo witch doctors had pronounced curses on that school that we were, that we were going to build in, in Haiti. And, uh, you know, it, that's because Voodooism. Voodooism, they worship demons. That's what they worship in, in Haiti. They worship what they fear. But here in the United States, I think Satan's best play, his best scheme is, hey, Satan doesn't exist. Satan doesn't exist because if Satan exists, then there must be a God. But listen, church, no matter what your frame of mind, the devil isn't something people dreamed up and tried to use to explain the existence of evil. Like it or not, every Christian has to come to terms with this fact. Satan, his demons are very real. Now, the devil in the Bible goes by many names. The aforementioned Satan, also Lucifer. He shows up, however, his primary identity is that of a deceiver. He's a liar. That's what he is. So much so that this is what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus says, For you are children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer <clears throat> from the very beginning. Satan wants to kill. Satan wants to literally kill. Satan also wants to kill relationships. Satan wants to kill purpose. Satan wants to kill focus. Satan wants to kill your connection between you and God, like Satan wants to destroy your faith. He wants to tempt. He wants to distract. He wants to discourage. He wants to get to the heart of the Father by constantly punishing his children. And so Jesus says he has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him when he lies. It is consistent with his character. He's just speaking his native tongue. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So mistruth, you know, non-truth, lies, all these things first originated with Satan. And I know a lot of us, we've got this caricature of, of Satan in our minds. You know, red suit, uh, horns, pointy tail, pitchfork. The Bible, however, doesn't tell us exactly what Satan looks like. You might be surprised to learn that. It doesn't tell us what Satan looks like. Instead, the Bible has this to say about Satan in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. He, it says that Satan himself masquerades, he disguises himself as an angel of light. Now, this is a really interesting thing, because in other words, Satan tries to convince unbelievers and believers alike that what God has deemed as evil is actually virtuous. And we see this happening in our world today, don't we? We, we see kind of these things that, that were once like, you know, biblically speaking, we would just say, man, that's a no-brainer. That, that's a sin. And now it's, it's virtue signaling. You know, not now it, it's, it's the new virtue. It's, it's the new righteousness in our culture. This is the best method of Satan. This is the thing that he does. He says, look, like this, come on. Don't be an antique. You know, don't be a dinosaur. Like, modernize a little bit. This, this is the new virtue. Scripture says that he also uses his deceptive skills to keep unbelievers in the dark. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who can't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good 
news. So Satan, he literally puts blinders on unbelievers. So if you've ever, you know, tried sharing the gospel with a friend, you got a neighbor, you got a relative, you got a loved one, and, and, and you're just, you're bearing your heart with them, you're explaining your faith, and it is just like, they're not receiving. There's just a brick wall. You know what that is? A spiritual warfare. That's what the Bible says. That's Satan, your enemy, putting the blinders on that person that you're sharing with. Friend, Satan, Satan is a liar. Elsewhere in the scriptures, Satan shows up as an accuser. He's constantly accusing Christians. Well, what is he accusing Christians of? Well, he's accusing Christians that they're not good enough. He's accusing Christians like, yeah, I, I know the Bible talks about that grace stuff and the sufficiency stuff and that if you put your faith in Christ, that's good enough. But, but I'm telling you, there's no way God can love you. I'm telling you, yeah, maybe you'll get to heaven, but like you're going to have the shack on the back lot, man. There's no way God loves you. God is constantly accusing, or Satan is constantly accusing us before God. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 says, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters... The accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. See, Satan is a fallen angel. Satan had prominence in heaven. He was beautiful. He was high-ranking. But then he became so prideful that he led a rebellion against God. And so he was cast out of heaven. And Scripture says he has fallen. He has come to earth. He is the one who accuses now our brothers and sisters. He accuses them before God day and night. And some of you, you know what that accusation sounds like. Because that's the negative self-talk that you constantly have in your head. It is the, you're not good enough, you're not acceptable enough, look at them, they're so much better than you. you. You could do so much more, you could be so much more, but you can't because you're a loser and you'll never amount to anything. That is the accusation of Satan, our adversary. He is a deceiver, he is an accuser. And one of the things he accuses is not just us, but the goodness of God. Man, is it, is it mental health, Ryan? Or is it spiritual warfare? Well, let me give you one clear way to delineate. One thing I know for sure is that Satan will always call into question the goodness of God. Don't you deserve more than that? God's not good to you. Look what they have. God's not good to you. God's holding out on you. In fact, wasn't that exactly what Satan said to Eve? When, when Eve was in the garden and, and she's looking at this fruit, didn't Satan say, hey, why is God not letting you eat that? He distracted her. He, he caused her to forget that God had given her 99 trees that she could have eaten of. Instead, just focus on the one out of 100. The one thing out of 100 she couldn't have. Distraction, discouragement, temptation. He called into question the goodness of God. God must be holding out on you. You need to try that and see that he's not holding out on you. That's what he does. He's a liar. He's an accuser. He accuses us that we're not good enough. And he accuses God that God is not good. Here's the second thing you need to know. Second thing. Don't look at your watch. We're going to go quick here at the end. All right? The second thing is that this struggle is lifelong. This struggle is lifelong. That means that on this side of heaven for as long as you live, this tension between world and and spirit, flesh and spirit, Satan and spirit, you're going to experience this. But friend, just because you're in a battle, don't take that to mean that you're going to lose. Don't, don't take that to mean like, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm a loser. I, I, I'm, I'm not very successful. I, I've not really achieved a whole lot in my lifetime. Don't think for a moment that just because you have this day in and day out struggle, that's going to wear you down like sandpaper and that you're going to lose. No, no, no. Listen, church, this is so important for you to know today. The struggle is lifelong, but the struggle, the struggle is already won. The struggle is already over. You know, I never shot a Nazi, all right? True story. Never shot a Nazi. However, my grandpa Gus did. My grandpa Gus stormed the beaches of Normandy. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. He was a survivor a rare survivor in many of these battles. And for a lot of his life, he, he kind of dealt with the wreckage of seeing friends lost, all this carnage. But I, I think to myself, man, I, I've never done anything as valiant, valiant as that, right? Like, I mean, the, the most courageous thing I do on a regular basis is open a jar of pickles, okay? 
I never stormed the beaches. I never fired a shot, and yet I get to enjoy the freedom. I get to enjoy the freedom. The struggle is already over. This is the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus fought the fight that we were not equipped to fight, my friend. That Jesus came, that he lived, that he breathed, that he not only had the friction of the whole world against him and the pressure, and he not only dealt with the human flesh, but he was outright accused and tempted and distracted and discouraged by Satan, and yet Jesus didn't falter all the way to the cross. And he brought himself back to life. And there is this picture on the cross that we have in which Jesus, in his final moments, in his capacity under his control, he says simply, it is finished. And with that, my friend, it is finished. The victory was won. The victory was sealed for you and for me, and this is what you need to know today. We don't fight for victory. You might think, man, there's no way. I've got these three adversaries. Let me tell you, I, I can't. I'm going to break down. No, listen, church, you don't fight for victory. You fight from victory. The battle is already won. The stinger is out of the bee. It's won. The gun is not loaded. It's empty. Like Satan, he tries to bully. He tries to accuse, but nothing sticks on you. He tries to deceive, but you have the truth. See, while Scripture says that Satan is an accuser, it also says that the Holy Spirit is an advocate. And that means that while Satan is going to speak all these horrendous things to you, while he's going to say all these horrendous things about you, the Holy Spirit is there saying, but you, there is no longer any condemnation for you because you are in Christ Jesus and the victory has already been won for you. Now listen, church, I could go through a dozen points, tips, tricks, things that you could do to be victorious, but it's all for naught if you don't just do this one thing today. Stop living with a mindset of defeat. Stop living from a mindset of victory. Not a victory that you won, but one that was won for you. One in which the freedom, you get the benefits, you get the joy, you get the knowledge that it's not up to you, it's not up to your goodness, it's not up to your abilities. It's the sufficiency of Christ. So this week, if you're struggling, if you, if you find yourself down and out, you, you find yourself doing the thing you, you don't want to do, despite the good you want to do, you, you find yourself with pressure to conform, man, if I just gave on this a little bit, I'd fit in. You know, you, you just feel supernatural, spiritual pressure on your life. I just want you to stop. And I just want you to pray. And I want you to pray like this. Will you pray with me?